like reflex. <laughs> Calling the March 22nd Pelham City Schools Board of Education meeting to order. Do we have any comments from the public on closed session items? Oh, wait, first we're going to acknowledge AB 361. Um, since we're still in the midst of the pandemic, every 30 days we're going to reevaluate health conditions and decide if we want to continue meeting in hybrid, go fully in person or virtual. And it looks like we are going to stay hybrid for now. Um, and if there's anyone in the public right now that would like to comment on anything in closed session, please put your first and last name in the chat and what you would like to speak about. Okay. All right. So we will adjourn the closed session. Thank you. Are reconvening. <laughs> We're reconvening the meeting at 6.02. Um, next item is adoption and approval of the agenda. I move to adopt and approve the agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, special recognitions, reports, and presentations. So excited to have people here in person. Yay. Um, Looks like first up, Kenilworth. Yes. Where are we going? Who's going to go first? Cassidy or Julia? Oh, Cassidy's here. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Good evening. Kenworth is here. We should have Clara Hansen and Olivia Alvaranga to present our students of the month. Dr. Clara. Progress. Okay. 
Kenworth Junior High is proud to announce our March Student of the Month, Cassidy Floyd. Cassidy has been chosen as the Student of the Month by her teachers because of her enthusiastic approach to life and dedication to be excellent in everything she does. All of Cassidy's teachers had wonderful comments to share about her. Ms. Moneris, Cassidy's math teacher, says, Cassidy is an excellent math student. Cassidy is an advanced math and puts a great amount of effort into every assignment, showing great detail and insight. Cassidy is also friendly and polite in class with all of her classmates, always willing to listen and answer questions in class. Mr. Eklund, Cassidy's history teacher, shared, Cassidy is one of those students who quietly puts together absolutely stellar work. She is quick to help out a classmate and always brings a bright smile to the classroom. Truly a pleasure to share class with her. Ms. Romano from Leadership says, Cassidy consistently demonstrates dedication to everything she commits herself to. She is consensuous, aware, responsible, and thoughtful. She also knows what her goal is, and before she takes step one, she makes sure she has a plan. Cassidy works well in any group you put her in and is able to troubleshoot things if the things don't go as planned. Ms. Fahey from PE states, Cassidy is a standout student who always is striving to do top-notch work. She is a supportive classmate and is willing to try new things with an open mind and willingness to help others. She is a good team player and respected by her peers. Cassidy's hard work and dedication have paid off with a 4.0 GPA for both her seventh and eighth grade years. Cassidy has a rigorous schedule of classes, including math one, advanced math, and advanced English and leadership. Cassidy is also a model student and Kenworth is very proud to call her a cult. Outside of school, Cassidy enjoys horseback riding at Horse Savvy Ranch where she has been taking lessons for approximately eight years. Cassie's love of horse has led her to volunteer at the ranch, where she helps rehabilitate horses in need by exercising them and ensuring they received important medications on their road to recovery. This passion of Cassidy is already pointing her in the direction of a future career working with animals, as she hopes to ensure more animals find the loving homes and medical care they deserve. Cassidy is looking forward to attending Casa Grande High School and applying to a college where she can learn more about animal science. Cassidy's drive and positive attitude are sure to take her far. Congratulations, Cassidy, for your accomplishments. Thank you, Clara. Is um, Olivia here, Dave? That's so far. Okay, then I'll be glad to present Olivia. I mean, uh, Julian. Is Julian Rose here? Not appear to be here. If it would be okay with the board, I can come back if Julian uh, logs on later. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess it's Petaluma Junior High here in person. We have a <laughs> Are you the reader or the student? Okay, well, come on up. That's great. To the podium. <laughs> oh, do we? Are you Addison? Hi, are you reading for Addison? What's her name, Dave, Normally. on the screen? Um, Audrey. Audrey, are you reading for um, Addison? No, I am not. No. Okay. 
Not in the meeting. Uh, Kelly, do you have the um, the presentation for Addison? Yeah, and Dana does. So if you could let her in, that'd be great. Do you guys see Duncan Fisher? He's supposed to read Addison's, otherwise I can do it. Yeah, he's not here. If you don't mind reading, we've got Addison here in person. Perfect, I'm happy yeah. to. Thank you. Petaluma, yeah, Petaluma Junior High School is excited to present Addison as one of our March 22 students of the month. She is an excellent student, an amazing musician, and a fine athlete. Addison's primary goal is to continue to do her best in whatever direction she chooses. Addison is one of those hardworking, creative, and naturally gifted students. She maintains straight A's in rigorous classes and has a strong work ethic. She had her start at Live Oak Charter and looks forward to returning to that model next year at Credo, but has cherished her time here as well. While attending PJHS, Addison has made many friends and connected with teachers and staff members who encouraged and inspired her. Her history teacher shares, Addie is incredibly thoughtful and looks out for others in a quiet, supportive, and caring way. She is always polite and expresses thanks for help and what we do as teachers. Addison is academically the best student I have. She participates in and contributes to the discussion going beyond just answering the question. Her band teacher adds, Addie is a fantastic student. She is hardworking, intelligent, loves music, and is an excellent bass guitarist. Beyond that, she is helpful, positive, and committed. Music is one of Addie's many talents. She began learning the viola in fourth grade and has continued with weekly private lessons and picking up both piano and guitar. In addition to performing with the regular school band, Addie is a member of our jazz band and also plays with the Santa Rosa Youth Symphony. Her commitment to performance and organizational skills have inspired her to take on the role of secretary for our PJHS band club. Beyond that, Addie has participated in several extracurricular activities, including being part of many sports teams and horseback riding. Currently, she is part of our track and field team. In addition, she loves to read and write. Her parents add, Addison has so many amazing qualities. While we are awed by how disciplined and self-directed she is in her studies, it is her love of learning combined with empathy and ever-present kindness that really makes us proud. Such a brave and confident young lady. We are so fortunate to have her in our lives. We too are proud. Addison is one of our students who stands out as an excellent role model, and we are pleased to honor her as student of the month. Congratulations. You have your family, your friends here? Very good, John. <laughs> <laughs> so that feels good. Oh, hey, wonderful. Thank you, Dana. All right, next up, Garrick. We have. Hello, uh, I'm here. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right, whenever you're ready, you can read uh, Garrick's write up. We are honored to present.
present Garrick Petrol as one of our March 2022 Students of the Month. He is a terrific student, a competitive athlete, and a natural leader. Garrick's primary goal in life is to be happy. As part of the bigger picture, Garrick intends to earn excellent grades throughout his high school and attend a well-respected college and eventually join enjoy having a prosperous and fulfilling job. Academically, Garrick is a top student. His junior high transcript shows his straight A's in our most competitive classes, illustrating Garrick's impressive initiative. Currently, Garrick is in leadership class and on the Bentham broadcast room. He often dresses up as our school's mascot and encourages teamwork by leading the PE classes in, in a class dance while dressed as the Bantam Rooster. At Grand Elementary School, he was selected to be principal for, the, for a day and played George Washington in his class play. His math teachers had this to say about Garrick. Even with a mask on, Garrick's smile shines through. Garrick is an excellent student. He is conscientious and thorough and thoughtful. In math, he is on task and a, a, an asset to any group. Outside of school, Garrick has a variety of interests. On the soccer field, Garrick is a natural. He has been playing competitively in the year-round NCFC soccer club for, for over five years and looks forward to, a, to playing at, for Petaluma Junior High School. Like many teens, Garrick enjoys and excels at video games. He has, a, a, he has the privilege of having nearly unlimited time with his controller with the controls by managing his time well and earning good grades. More recently, Garrick tried his hand at fantasy football. Although he didn't win, he enjoys doing more research and improving his odds in the next round. Uh, Garrick enjoys traveling with his family. They've already made several trips to Mexico, Mexico and Hawaii and explore California and several other states. Because of his medical history, Garrick's family feels particularly fortunate. Or Garrick was less than a year old, he was diagnosed with heart abnormalities. We are told by his pediatric specialist that he would likely need surgery and may not be able to function as a normal child. We had to lower our expectations and hope Garrick would at least be an average. Ultimately, we made the tough decision to forego the surgery. Eventually, Garrick outgrew his ailments and went on to become a superstar athlete, student, friend, and son. Garrick Pectrol is one of our most amazing students. He, today, he is a healthy, happy young man who excels at everything he does and shares his joy of life with others, both at school and in the community. We are proud to have Garrick represent Petaluma Junior High School as student of the month. Thank you guys. Thank okay. you. Congratulations. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Do we know if Julian is here? This, did he show up from Kenilworth? Okay. Um, yeah, we can still do the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So I'll present for for Julian, Julian's not on. Is that what I heard, Dave? Yeah. Um, I'm here. Oh. oh Olivia, go. will you read for Julian? I don't think Julian has joined us, but would you be uh, able to prevent, uh, present for Julian? Yeah. Great, thank you, I Olivia. This paper, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Kenilworth Junior High School is proud to introduce our March student of the month, Julian Rose. Julian's teachers have chosen him as, a, as student of the month because of his ingenuity, fantastic sense of humor, and his dedication to produce work of the highest quality. Julian's teachers were enthusiastic in their praise of this exemplary, exemplary student. Mr. Ryder, Julian's math teacher, shared, Julian is a great student to have in class, always positive and upbeat. Julian is always willing and wanting to help other students at his table and in his group. Julian always has his hand up, willing to try problems in class or give insight about the work we are doing. 
Mr. Eklund from history class says, Julian cracks me up. He always has a unique perspective. He is always willing to contribute to class discussions. He is bright and has a way of bringing out the humor in so many different topics. He is quite entertaining and definitely brightens my day whenever he is in class. Mr. Radke, Julian's science teacher shared, Julian is a great addition to his classes, a good participant with a unique sense of humor and an easygoing, calm nature. Julian is a strong student in both independent and group work. He's always on top of things and can be counted on to assist in class. As a self-described giant teddy bear, Julian is kind and fun to be around and has many friends who he enjoys spending time with at school. Julian has many hobbies and expressed how much he likes finding creative ways to work with his hands. Whether it's picking locks with the kid at home, solving Rubik's Cube puzzles, making objects out of origami or knitting, he is always finding ways to use his ingenuity to stay entertained. Julian's favorite subject is math. As he says, he has a mind for algorithms and, and equations, and it is something that comes naturally to him. Julian performs well in all of his classes, holding a GPA of 3.39. Julian's future goals include attending Rancho Cotati for high school, graduating with high, with high grades, and continuing on to college. Julian plans to pursue a career in zoology where he can follow his passion for working with and helping animals. Kenilworth is proud of this exceptional young person, and we look forward to watching his goals become a reality. Congratulations, Julian, for your accomplishments. Thank you, Olivia. Congratulations, Julian. All right. Thank you. All right. Up next, I see Shireen. Are you presenting Petaluma High? Uh, I am not. Okay. All right. Oh, the cost is up next. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Hi, Josie. Are you doing both? Um, yeah. Presentations. Okay. So, who are you reading first? Uh, Rachel. Okay. Rachel, are you here? Yes. Oh, you're on the screen. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, our first student of the month is Rachel Amstutz. Rachel plans to study biochemical engineering at a four-year university since they enjoy designing and building things. Through the course of high school, they have experienced several science classes, chemistry, astronomy, and robotics that they found interesting. This year, they joined the Law and Justice Club and have appreciated discussing various topics. Outside of school, they enjoy small crafts, woodworking, and spending time outdoors. Recently, they have cr created several wood furniture pieces from personal designs and hope to improve their skills. One of their favorite pieces is a desk built in the shape of an S. Among other crafts, Rachel enjoys constructing jewelry and working with modeling clay. They also love animals and worked as a dog walker during high school. Recently, they started volunteering with cats at Petaluma Pet Pals. The Great Place Petaluma Pet Pals thrift store they volunteer at works to financially support the cat rescue. They have become passionate about transit and hope to live in an urban area where they will be able to fully utilize an electric bike instead of owning a car. Congratulations, Rachel. Congratulations, Rachel. All right. Okay, our second student of the month is Yvonne Siao. Okay. Yvonne likes math and science. She aces almost every single math test and she has been a member of the computer science club for four years. She's always striving to excel. She took mostly advanced courses and had a zero period every year. From CASA, she earned five subject excellence awards three overall academic excellence awards and was top 10 every year. She plans to major in computer science or engineering in college. She likes to play music from different genres with different musical instruments. She's been playing piano for 13 years. She not only plays classical music on the piano, she also likes to play music from anime and video games on piano. She spent more than 250 hours each year practicing piano. 
She has also been playing flute for eight years, participated in the band for six years, and is currently a member of the symphonic band at Casa Grande. Being in the band taught her the importance of trust and teamwork. The synergy from band and the positive atmosphere also taught her to stay optimistic. During her free time, she also hand makes birthday presents for each of her friends, such as clay accessories and origami artwork. Congratulations, Yvonne. All right, congratulations. And thank you, Josie, again for reading. All right. I'm actually doing close my mind. Oh, okay. Well, come on. Yeah. Come up. Do you want to read from the podium? I mean, do you guys want to say? You definitely have to come up to the podium. Whatever you, whatever you want, Katie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's on. Okay. We can hear it. Okay. okay. Our first year of the month is Meg Rawson. Meg is honored to have been chosen as part of the school student of the month and inspired to be here today. She is an AP scholar currently preparing for her six upcoming AP tests and has juggled, juggled her classes while being employed part-time at Craven's Candy Emporium downtown Petaluma. Earlier this school year, she was selected as team captain for Petaluma High's girls tennis team and after a successful season playing singles, was also awarded second place in the VVAL doubles tournament. Passionate about community service and social work, Meg has been a member of the PHS chapter of Rotary Interact Club for two years, as well as a member of the Sonoma County Junior Commission on the status of women. She plans to enjoy the rest of her time at PHS and then looks forward to starting as a freshman at Santa Clara University as a web design and engineering major in the oh, fall. Nice, good, good for you. I know. Yeah, I know. Congratulations. You were like this big when you <laughs> <laughs> is Amy here or is Amy on Zoom? Oh, yay. Okay. Our second student of the month is Amy Ayala Gallardo. Am I pronouncing that right? Okay, awesome. Okay. Amy is a senior at Paluma High School that has been committed to her school community. Amy has been on the varsity badminton team since her freshman year, which was very rewarding as the team secured the pennant. Since her junior year, Amy has been given the position of team captain of the badminton team. She has also held a presidential role in bilingual students ambassador since her freshman year. BSA's main goal is to create a more welcoming space for multilingual and multicultural families. BSA helps interpret at school events, tutor ESL students, and holds cultural events and activities for the community. She is a strong believer that students should feel more comfortable and welcomed in their new environment and should be allowed to adjust to their surroundings without having to lose their culture. She also has taken a rigorous workload throughout high school, balancing multiple AP honors and SRJC classes with the rest of her commitments. Amy plans on attending UC Davis in the fall and will be majoring in design. Outside of school, Amy volunteers at the Marine Mammal Center where she helps take care of seals. Amy enjoys spending her time with her family, especially her older sister, as she looks up to her. Yay. I'm at the Marine Mammal Center. Awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> this is such a fun time of year when we talk to the high schoolers and get to know what they're doing after graduation. Yeah. All right. Why don't we take like a two minute break to give all of you a chance to 
leave. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to stay for the rest, it's up to you. I think the next please, yeah. All right, congratulations, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, wow. Yeah. She was online. Good job, Katie. Good job. Thank you taking the microphone. <laughs> Man, we lost her. Okay. I, that's true. It's, it's, yeah. it's so nice they got their acceptance. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. We went to UC Davis yesterday mm -hmm. for a tour. For me, it was like nine. Yeah. 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 So cool. All right. Reconvening. And up next, item 7.2 human interaction presentation. Cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to provide you with an update on the work of our HI committee this year. So presenting with me tonight, we have Shereen Jackson, English teacher and HI teacher at Petaluma High, and Patty Cota, fifth grade teacher from Grant. Share my screen. Yeah, I'll So our goal for the committee for this year was to select a sexual health curriculum for upper elementary, for junior high and high school that meets compliance requirements for California Healthy Youth Act and California Health Content Standards. That was our, our, our overarching goal for this year. And Shireen's gonna talk a little bit about the purpose of the California Healthy Youth Act, just as a little review. So uh, the California Healthy Youth Act is provide, to provide pupils with knowledge and skills necessary to protect their sexual and reproductive health from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections and from unintended pregnancy, and to provide pupils with the knowledge and skills they need to develop healthy attitudes concerning adolescent growth and development, body image, gender, sexual orientation, relationships, marriage, and family and also to promote understanding of sexuality as a normal part of hum human development to ensure pupils receive integrative, comprehensive, accurate, and unbiased sexual health and HIV prevention instruction and provide educators with clear tools and guidance to accomplish that end and to provide pupils with the knowledge and skills necessary to have healthy, positive, and safe relationships and behaviors. So focused on knowledge and skills. 
And Patty will talk a little bit about just summarizing what the key requirements are under the law. All righty. So the California Healthy Youth Act um, went into effect in 2016. The key requirements under law, um, sexual health instruction is required at least once in grades seven through eight and at least once in grades nine through 12, which must meet a set of contact requirements outlined by Ed Code 51934. Any instruction that takes place in grades K through 12 must meet a set of baseline requirements outlined in Ed Code 51933. Parents must be notified of applicable instruction at least 14 days prior to instruction. Parents may opt their child out of instruction and teachers must receive content specific training to provide instruction. And I'll add to this that the requirement under the Healthy Youth Act is that it has to happen once in the junior high and the, and the high school. For fifth grade, why we're looking at upper elementary puberty talks at the upper elementary is because although it's not a, a legal mandate of CHIA, the Healthy Youth Act, it is it does show up as the only grade level in elementary for sex ed. So we wanted to make sure that we also included um, selection of curriculum for that grade level. So when we talk about what those baseline requirements are, we want it to be age appropriate. This is all from, from um, California Healthy Youth Act. It needs to be medically accurate. We want it to be appropriate for, for all races, gender, sexual orientations, students with disabilities, different cultural ethnic identities, our English language learners. Um, we don't want it to reflect any um, bias or promote bias against any of our protected classes of, of students. We really want to affirmatively recognize that people have different sexual orientations and we want to teach about gender, gender expression, identity, and the harm of gender stereotypes. The, another big piece of this is encouraging communication with trusted adults, right? So parents and trusted adults. Um, and we want kids to, to, we want to teach them the value and prepare them for committed relationships and, and giving them the, that, those skills and that knowledge to form those healthy relationships, making, um, you know, implementing healthy decisions about their own sexuality. And we don't, we want all religious doctrine, we don't want it to be promoted and we don't want it in place um, in these lessons, of course. So what we did this year, so that just gives you the background, what we were looking at. Um, and we had uh, a committee comprised of teacher representatives from elementary, from secondary. We met from November through March. And um, what we did from Ed Services is we vetted and selected the curriculums using the California Healthy Kids Resource Center that actually conducted, uh, uh, got together a number of professionals from um, Department of Public Health, from California Department of Education, Planned Parenthood organizations, uh, just a nice subset of professionals to look at curricula, um, so providers that submitted their curricula to this organization um, and the organization, the Adolescent Sexual Health Group. And so they went ahead and reviewed a, a number of curricula. And so we looked at that as a place to vet. And then we also took recommendations from teachers within our own system. And we also had wonderful local community organizations such as Amor Para Todos and North Bay LGBTQI families who also provided a subset of some curriculum that they had viewed as some of the top most gender inclusive curriculum um, that's out there. All right, so Patty, we'll talk about what we looked at. Right. So the following um, curriculum was uh, reviewed. Um, there was three elementary curricula that we talked with. Um, one was Planned Parenthood of Northern California. Another was Superstar Health Education. And the third in elementary was um, Health Connected. The two secondary curricula we reviewed was Health Connected, which was Teen Talk in middle school, as well as Teen Talk for high schoolers, um, and Positive Prevention Plus, which also was for junior high and high school. And the committee members were tasked with um, reading through the lessons and evaluating them as a group. And we discussed and shared out. So when we were looking at evaluating this curriculum, 
you know, baseline was making sure it was compliant with California Healthy Youth Act. And from there, we looked at some other components. So the first was standards compliance alignment. How well does it support California Healthy Youth Act? How well does it support California health content standards? And then looking at components that are important to teaching and learning, right? How are the materials organized? Um, are the directions clear and concise? Are there technology and digital resources? Is it easy to identify and integrate the materials? And then universal access, how well do the tools support the range of learners? Are the ma materials available in English and Spanish? Um, do the materials encourage a variety of teaching methodologies and a variety of um, student output? So how are kids being engaged with the, with the materials? And then also looking at, is there what, was there an adaptation, particularly for the curriculum at the high school level um, for all abilities? And Shireen. Um, so the representatives on the committee selected Health Connected as the curriculum to pilot for elementary. So that's elementary puberty talk for fifth grade and um, secondary. So teen talk middle school for seventh and eighth grade, either at the junior highs or the seventh and eighth grade classes for our K-8 schools and teen talk high school for the ninth grade HI classes. Um, and then there's also the teen talk, teen talk adopt, uh, hmm, adapted for all abilities. Um, so the way that we did this was um, like, as Patty mentioned, we were using the shared decision-making process. We came to a consensus um, in our uh, discussions using the criteria that Esmeralda just mentioned on the previous slide. Okay, so just some highlights um, regarding Health Connected and some of the, the rationale and what we saw. Um, so there are philosophical and pedagogical approaches, so definitely gender inclusive. So all courses, and, and this is a recommendation now before, prior um, to California Healthy Youth Act, typically they would separate. Um, and now we have a mixed gender environment to establish those norms and respectful, appropriate language, building those communication skills um, and making sure that we're inclusive, right? And we're not separating um, by gender. Um, that there's an emphasis on trusted adult engagement. So there's a trusted adult interview, just really making sure that students have that um, that ability to, to seek support from a tested adult. And there's also a variety of teaching methodologies and that was something um, and a lots of digital resources and everything sort of being laid out for teachers um, to be able to utilize so and, and engage a variety of different learning styles. Um, multiple opportunities for students to practice. They're, they're communicating about those particular topics um, in, a, in a facilitated environment and all handouts and presentations are available um, for parents and for students in English and Spanish. Um, so those were some of the highlights um, that also stood out to us. Now in terms of next steps, so we, um, one of the requirements, as you know, is that uh, staff must be trained. Um, and this is clearly a, a different type of um, sexual health curriculum given our new law. So we really want to equip our staff to be able to teach and really establish that learning environment with such important topics. And so teacher training and professional learning will be provided. We'll put together instructional materials order. The other piece that's really helpful is Health Connected has a family engagement person. So from the onset, before instruction, even even begins, we will engage our parents and really loop them in on what this means, um, give them access to viewing the lessons so they can make informed decisions on behalf of their own children and just have that two-way communication and be very proactive with our parent community. And of course, we will evaluate and get annual feedback from, from our staff, look at you know, the quality of the materials in terms of you know, how it's playing out in the classroom. Are there any adjustments that we need to make? Is this really meeting the needs of our students? So here talk about just briefly about if the parents gets all the information and they decide they don't want their child to participate it's 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 an opt out it's an opt out, out correct so if a if a parent decides that it's not something that they'd like their student to participate in then they would write um to the principal but saying i'd like my not the expectations that all the students are going to do that do the go through the the curriculum and if par parents are notified and if they don't want their child to stay, they can always opt, they can opt out. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. That's part of part of that code law. Yeah. Um, that's Merelda. Yeah. On the uh, teacher training, what teachers are gonna be trained 
Is it just fifth grade teachers? Is it all teachers? What about it in secondary and high school? Great question. So, um, so the teachers that are slated, so it'll be fifth grade teachers um, because we're identifying fifth grade at the elementary level. At the high school level, it'll be our HI teachers. And our HI teachers are the experts, really, um, because they engage in this work on the daily. Um, and, so, and then at the middle school level, um, many of our science teachers are the ones that are delivering this content. Um, and at the um, at Pass in Cherry Valley, you know, some of them teach all of it. So um, anyone who is um, teaching a course and delivering this will be trained. It's a requirement. It's, it's a certain number. So elementary teachers need to conduct six hours on Zoom um, training. Then um, secondary, because there's more lessons, there's about 15 to 21 lessons, depending on the level, that's about 12 hours, nine to 12 hours of training. Um, yeah. And it's all on Zoom. So training. this would be like a, a, a six week course in like within HI. So, or, the, you know, like a grading period or just two weeks. Do, they, do you already have that information or not? We haven't quite sequenced yeah. everything, but to give you an example, the elementary fifth grade could complete these lessons in one week. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would be about the same amount of time that we spend on it in ninth grade HI class right now, which is three weeks or so. Okay. And also just to clarify, this particular component of HI is just the sexual health component at the okay. secondary and the puberty talk portion for fifth grade. There clearly the, the health framework involves much more, right? Mental wellness, uh, nutrition. So there's other pieces and we'll be continue to add those on um, and layer them on to all of the grade levels um, and make sure it was really critical that we did this first and we, we needed to get in compliance and get everything in order. <laughs> Good point. That's great. Yes. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about the status quo? I mean, I really appreciate the, uh, the process you took, confident in what the decision that you guys have made. But what's going on now? What, what is this replacing? So there have been, there's some videos that are out there, just your standard sort of human anatomy kind of what, what you're not necessarily seeing right now is the piece related to gender identity, gender expression, um, curriculum that is necessarily... Um, written to Chaya's um, expectations. Um, that's not, to, so there's, there are, for example, um, teachers at schools that have done some of the puberty pieces, but they're a little antiquated and some are just kind of holding because we wanna make sure we have what they need in place and get them trained and all of that. Just, just, to, just to add on and, and Patty and Shireen, please feel free to, to jump in as well. But my, especially at elementary, one of the concerns and why we have have a committee to, to, to do this work is that some schools are doing certain curricula, a certain curriculum, others are doing another curriculum, doing different videos. And so there's sort of a hodgepodge of different things that have happened over the years. So the effort, the, the idea of bringing together an HI committee was to get all of us rowing in the same direction and with the same, with the same curriculum so that a, a fifth grader at um, McNear is getting the same content as a fifth grader at McDowell or Grant, fifth grader at Grant or McKinley, et cetera, et cetera. So at the secondary, Shereen, I, I don't know if you want to jump in about the current practice at Petaluma High School. I don't know if you know about, you know, what's happening at um, Kenilworth, Petaluma Junior or, or, or CASA, but. Um, I mean, I know at CASA and at Petaluma High School, we use a lot of the same guest speakers for a lot of the content, like Planned Parenthood for um, information about reproductive anatomy and STIs and um, birth control. We use Verity for um, information about sexual assault and consent. Um, and I know C CASA does the same. Um, we use One Love for information about healthy and unhealthy relationships and relationships that are abusive. Um, and then there are like the, the parts that right now the guest speakers don't cover, we have like made up or found um, lessons that would fit with that and we share across town. So this is really, yeah, there are lots of guest speakers, that like, and, but this is making sure that everyone is getting, all students are getting the same content when they go through the, through HI, HI. 
Oh, is, are we aiming for fall implementation? Correct. Correct. Yes, we we do have some people that are eager and want to jump on now. So I am looking at what might there are some possibilities for people who might want to pilot before the end of the year. But I would say 80 percent will to 90 percent will will do that in the fall. So we'll have all those training opportunities set and ready to go. So will the training happen during the summer? So um, so we'll have, we can do some summer offerings potentially. And then we can also do, um, the nice thing about zoom is they can, they can do after hours. So they could do like a one to a four kind of half the day, or they can do a three to six 30 sometimes with some districts they've done Saturday. So they're very nimble and flexible. Um, and they can also offer, um, support through zoom. So if we have a teacher that says, oh, gosh, I'd really love to have someone to kind of help and listen to what I'm saying and help, you know, chime in. That's another there based out of San Mateo in Santa Clara County. And so their educators stay there. So it's, they can't venture out to other counties, but they can through Zoom. So there'll be some additional support that we can provide there. So I know some campuses were putting their, uh, their puberty education on hold until this was finished. Are they the ones that will maybe be piloting the press they'll have that opportunity to jump on if they'd like i Great. think there's an april training date there's Correct. some training opportunities yeah. in april Perfect. then they could present they could present yeah. it before the end of the year yeah that's great i would just hate for a fifth grader to not get anything yes. until right. seventh grade right 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 yeah yeah thank you mm -hmm. okay Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for being on the committee and doing this too. It was great. Yes. Thank you to all the committee. <laughs> Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Patty. Sounds great. Yes. Right. Okay. We expect that each will be um, an energetic presentation from Chris Thomas. All right. Update on the capital project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I look back and the last update I did was February of 21. So it's been about a year. Um, the PowerPoint slides that I have do not walk through everything we've completed. They really are walking through what we've completed in the last 18 to 24 months. Items that are in design, both for summer of 23 and um, stuff we're planning to start in summer of 22. <clears throat> Okay, so feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So I'm going in alphabetical order generally with the school site. So um, here's Mary Collins at Cherry Valley. And um, most of you are aware we completed an exterior and interior renovation to the child care portable at Cherry Valley. You know, that portable, I don't know the last time it had some TLC, it was in desperate need. Um, I think that the students and the families who attend that program were thrilled. We have a new child care provider there, so it just made sense. So, and we, we did a lot of that work in-house with our own staff. We did a combination of contracting out for some of it, but most of it we did in-house. Our, our, our um, staff did a great job. We also painted the entire campus. Looks amazing, the color scheme. When we work with teachers and the principal to determine the color scheme, and people are generally really thrilled. I, I really think it was transformative for that school and we're super excited to have completed it. That said, I wasn't a real big fan of the prior color scheme, so. <laughs> yeah, I will say just, yeah. just walking on that campus, it is transformational. Chris, yeah. they, they, it that, beautiful. that committee did a fantastic job. Yeah, it was, and it was a, I would say it was a really good process of, of parents and staff and, and architects and myself working together. So a true example of what a team effort can accomplish. And we also did some window replacement in the kitchen. So those, the kitchen, you know, it's kind of in the, the lodge building. It's kind of an annex to the lodge. Those windows were very old wooden sash windows and they were, had a lot of dry rots. So we did, we were able to replace those windows and get them painted during that project. Um, we also are planning for a roofing replacement for the lodge. The lodge is having definitely some, um, water intrusion issues. And you'll notice as we go through this, a lot of this is roofing and HVAC. So big surprise, but they, those two things generally go together because if we're gonna replace a mechanical, you know, you gotta crane it off, crane a new one back on. You want to be able to do the roof at the same time, okay? Um, we're also in design for repairs, regrading of the blacktop area. So for those of you who are familiar with Cherry Valley, it's it's 
you know, you've got your field and track, you've got your play structure and your solar panels. And then that black top kind of generally slopes down at a fairly steep slope toward the buildings. So um, we're working with engineers and architect QKA to really come up with how do we flatten that play, play black top play area out, protect the buildings potentially with some retaining walls, and then get some ADA accessible paths of travel that are crumbling and have tripping hazards. We didn't want to just replace them without addressing the ADA accessibility. And so all of that's in design right now. Um, I would anticipate most likely summer of 23. And then we're still working on that kitchen reconfiguration. Again, that's been on the books for a while, but things keep bubbling to the top that are much more critical. At Grant, um, you know, it's a newer renovated school. And so there's not as much work to do here. We've done quite a bit of smaller projects in my first few years here. Um, currently we're looking at HVAC replacement and we're looking at re doing roofing replacement and HVAC replacement for their multi as well. So just like Cherry Valley's multi needs a new roof, new mechanical units. Is the track done? So we removed all of the- All of that awful stuff. Yes. But it's at, it's dirt right now. Yeah. <laughs> so generally, elementary campuses don't have formal tracks. Okay. Cherry Valley being an exception because it's a K eight. Even McKinley, which is has packs, also doesn't have a track. The fact that it was designed kind of with a track is problematic. So it may be that we need to come in and look at using a different type of product, whether it's decomposed granite or something. Um, it's, a, it's fine. I was just wondering if that was going to be it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's it for now, yeah. is what I would say. Never know what that priority might change, but it's it for now. Um, so going on to McDowell, um, we currently are in color committee to determine new paint colors for McDowell. We're super excited. That process has been a very robust process. We're using with the same, we're using the same designers as we did on Cherry Valley. We've got um, a good teacher participation, administration partic participation, even our art docent has started to participate since she's located on the campus and of course adult ed. And so um, we're getting very close to picking those colors. We had a very productive meeting late last week um, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to go out to bid and paint that school this summer. Worst case scenario, we, you know, depending on the bidding environment, it could be more in the fall. My preference is to try to get it done in July, but we'll see. We're also doing installation of new carpet, new floor in most of the classrooms, not all, but most. So the portables don't need it. There's some classrooms in the E-wing that are already vinyl, but the two kinder classrooms, um, the carpet is in particular what we're targeting. The vinyl tile is fine, but the carpet, I, I don't know what era that, it, probably when my brothers went there back in the eighties. I don't know, <laughs> it's pretty bad. So we, we definitely want to replace that carpet. So that's going to happen in June, probably right after um, we get out of school. And then the renovation of their multipurpose and kitchen with new flooring, similar to what we did at Valley Vista, is also currently on the books in design. Again, certain things start taking priority. Um, we felt like paint and protecting the exterior of the buildings was important. One, one other note. Uh, and you'll see this when we get to McKinley. One of the things that we do when we go in and we paint a school is we start assessing their exterior signage, much like we did at Petaluma High School. So when we get to McKinley, you'll see we've already installed brand new signage for all the classrooms. For some reason, this district, generally speaking, there was some exceptions like Grant. Um, we use stencils. We did not, you know, we, we, or teachers put up their own paper signs. That's not accessible to someone who's visually impaired. And so we're systematically going through after we paint a school, we identify all the doors, work with the school site for um, exactly what to call every room, like mechanical room, custodial room. It also helps our first responders in an emergency know that that's where the electrical room is versus just a random door that's not labeled. So that's as we go through and paint, then we also come back and we start assessing all their signage and then we add new signs. So. That'll be, it takes us a little while. Like we just got the McKinley signs in um, a month or so ago. And that paint, that school was painted a year and a half ago, but it takes us time to kind of work through all that process. So that will also be an outcome once we paint um, McDowell. McKinley, again, you can see I'm going in alphabetical order. So there's no priority here. 
um, exterior paint, we already completed that. We, you know, we matched the whole school site, all new exterior signage. We just completed that. Super excited about that. I think we missed a couple doors um, that we'll put in when we put in the new building, new play structure. You know, I just met, there's a sale going on right now. Uh, the goal is um, their PTA wants to partner with us. They've come up with some money. We have an amazing play structure that I'm going to be bringing to you at the next board meeting. It's um, probably the most significant play structure we put in, but be, given the size of the school and the age of their play structures, it's, it's quite almost embarrassing. We are going to leave the swings because we do know <laughs> swings are important to kids, um, but, the, um, but stay tuned on that because I'll be bringing that new play structure. We're going to purchase the equipment and then we'll do the installation separately. Hoping to take advantage of a really good sale that's going on. To say. Cool. Um, <clears throat> we're in design for replacing that existing, formerly known as the SCO building, now known as the South County building, with taking that old portable building out and replacing it with a modular construction building, which is a stick building. It's just built in a factory and put on a foundation here with three TK slash kinder classrooms. Basically, those are classrooms with a bathroom inside designed more around TKK and a South County classroom that has all of the items that the South County program needs, including a laundry built in between. Um, that is going to give McKinley two additional classrooms um, and it will more importantly get all of their kinder back down into the kinder. As Matthew knows, one of the kinder classrooms is actually down, I think by the second grade mm -hmm. with no restroom. So no, it does have a restroom. That's why it's down there. Okay, got it. Yeah, but it's, um, far, but it's, it's very far, far from the, from the kinder. Yeah, it's very far from the kinder play yard. So that is in design. And we're hoping to actually come to you in April or May to get the construction of the modular going. That'll be a separate contract because they'll start building that in the factory as we work through then how to do the site work. Um, that design is almost finished and we're hoping to get into DSA soon. <laughs> And then again, their, their multi is in desperate need of renovation, just like Valley Vista's, probably summer of 23. McNear, um, we um, did some repairs and, and repaving and restriping, kind of almost a reconfiguration of their kinder play yard. We actually just had a company come in and replace all of the brackets on that kinder play structure. Uh, we found out most of those brackets were breaking. That's not on here, but that's some of the stuff that we're doing. We're looking at um, upgrades to their HVAC currently. And again, their multi needs some TLC. Their multi in particular is a little bit more complicated because they have restrooms on both sides of the kitchen is in the middle restrooms. The restrooms are not ADA accessible and we don't have the real estate to make them accessible, which means we'll probably have to expand out the building a bit to try to get enough clearances to do that. So. This is a super important one, but it's going to take a more complicated design effort. Okay. Pengrove. Ah, uh, Pengrove. <laughs> <laughs> one of our older schools. Um, so we've reconfigured the lower parking lot. That's been super successful. It has not, has not um, addressed every traffic challenge in that little corner, but it's definitely helped. Um, we put in a new ADA accessible ramp from the basement up to the office, and you're going to hear ADA access a lot because our focus is safety, securing our buildings to make sure that they last a long time, and making sure they're accessible. New libraries in design, as you know, we took out their library, converted it to a classroom because of growth, so they need a new library building, um, and they need we, we need more classroom space, not necessarily because we're going to make more students there, but we've taken away so much auxiliary space for the existing student body that we need to um, we need to improve that. So the goal is to eliminate a, a, a square building of four classrooms. It's modular in design with a six classroom building. Um, it'll sit on the same footprint, but get closer to the track and field without impacting too much the blacktop. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to have to bring in four portables because we need swing space, what we call swing space. So while that, in order to deconstruct that building, to put a new building there, we have to move everybody out. It's going to be a little tricky because of the year round schedule. So again, this is modular. We'll be coming back to you with a proposal or a contract 
to start the construction and the factory for the building. Then we'll be working on the timing of exactly when to bring on the portables. I'm anticipating fall break right now. We bring portables in. They've got three week break, move the classrooms over and then demolish before the kids get back. But it may be more like we bring the portables on, work on setting them up and we do the demolition and move in over winter break. Either way, the building is being constructed. So it doesn't hold it up. We just want to be really thoughtful because the coordination of that is a little bit tricky. Um, and I should go back to McKinley for just a moment. What are we going to do with the South County program for the building we're going to take out and replace with three? Um, when we get to the end, I'll tie that in because we're hoping to use a different building that's being designed for preschool right now at McDowell and not have to bring portables. So we're saving the taxpayers, we're saving the district money by trying to be super efficient with our dollars. And then the student restroom repairs, we've already done a bunch of repairs to the restrooms and the multi to make them accessible. Across in the multi, there's a set of boys restrooms in particular that some of the urinals, the plumbing was bad. So we also picked up those repairs. The last one is that the kinder restroom, the kinder classroom, that um, is in the building right across from the admin. It had two very small kinder restrooms, little boys, little girls, that the sewer lines are bad. They had filled them with concrete, the sewer lines a long time ago. They're too small, they're not accessible. So the goal would be to come in. And when we did the ramp, we actually put the infrastructure in to extend the new sewer lines to the building. So we've already done half the work. So the goal would be to do a design where we take out both restrooms, put in one ADA accessible restroom, and then connect new sewer lines to the ones we ran under the ramp. So trying to be forward thinking as we're doing some of this work. Going on to Valley Vista, again, um, we've already completed their multi-purpose. It's beautiful. I wanted to put it on here just because I'm so proud of it. Um, the color choices in particular are really nice and go with the school. Um, the new childcare building is there, new asphalt. Um, and we did complete window replacements. So if you think of the wings, some of the wings, the wing on the lower blacktop, it already had new aluminum windows on the front breezeways, but the three buildings behind, most of them did not. So we actually took out all that old glazing, put in new aluminum windows, um, which Gary wanted me to do for years. And it, we finally got it done. So I can check that one off. I was able to tell him in January that we did it. <laughs> Okay, Kenilworth, moving into our secondary. So, uh, Kenilworth. Uh, has been up there for that HVAC thing. Well, this, we completed phase two last summer. So phase two was all new. We abandoned the boilers, abandoned the radiant heat and the concrete, put in all new mechanical systems for buildings F, G, J, and the wood shop that all got completed. It was a labor of love, to say the least, because what the, what the architects found is that <laughs> Kenilworth is, if anything, it's not a cookie cutter. So normally you get a classroom building, think about Valley Vista and some of the elementaries, and every classroom is ge generally the same, not for Kenilworth. And so when you're thinking about adding mechanical units and duct work where there's already existing lighting and TVs and whiteboards, and Dave's looking at me because he knows <laughs> the TVs alone were problematic. So you're trying to put light, you're trying to put new duckboard in for these new systems and you've got all these lighting systems. And so anyway, it was definitely labor of love. We learned a lot, which is going to inform the next phase, which we're in design for the summer, which will be the final phase in which we're doing um, buildings, I think F and F and H. Um, and so we're super excited about just kind of knocking that out. Then all of the classroom buildings will have their own controllable heat and AC. <clears throat> no more radiant heat, get rid of the boilers. We'll have to refocus on library and um, admin building to see if they have a need. But right now that will complete our design for that. Um, we also are in the process of reviewing the existing solar system. Again, you guys are aware of this. The solar system was put in back in 2005. On the big domed roofs, it was stick and peel roll out flexible solar panels. It was a technology that was the latest thing until it wasn't. <laughs> Picture 
adhesive, solar electrical currents on top of on top of metal roofs, and then water getting in underneath. And you've got what we would call electrolysis, which creates rust and erosion of the existing roofing structure. We're working with the company that bought that PPA because we don't own that solar system. And they're working with their insurers to come in and take all of that off, repair the roofs, and then figure out what to do with the um, solar. I was hoping that was going to happen this summer, but because there's so many organizations involved, um, it's probably going to be more like summer of 23, but we're continuing to hammer on that project. This has been ongoing for quite a while. It has. Yes. We found about three and a half years ago, a hole, there was a roof leak. And when we went up to assess the roof leak, this is when one of our retirees was helping out. They peeked under the, the, flexible solar panels and there was a hole in the metal roof. That's how it came to our attention. And we've been working on a solution ever since. Not an easy fix. No. Okay, going on to Petaluma Junior High School. Again, completed the exterior paint that looks fabulous. You know, I walk the dogs there a lot just because like, you get some good hills going up and down. And I ask people, you know, as I run into them, oh, what do you think of the paint? And I've got a lot of a lot of positive <laughs> reviews. And if you haven't seen the new mural up there, please go take a look at yeah, it. Maxfield Ball did it. He yeah. completed it. Again, that was a process where he worked with the school site, the students and the staff. They came up with a design. The district just, that's an example of us going to them and saying, hey, what do you think about putting a mural? Originally, I had tried to work with the architects to actually take out that ugly breezeway and put in like clear glass or something. But because it's all structurally related, I couldn't just do that. So the next best thing was a mural. And it really does, it really, it really does improve that from the campus. So thank you to Maxfield Bala and thank you to the team at Petaluma Junior High who were able to work with him. Um, and so again, um, we redid the pathway that goes all the way from the lower fields up that was failing in a big way, especially after the big mudslide we had a couple years ago. Trees at Petaluma Junior High School are an ongoing issue. I mean, we're spending thousands of dollars. When you look at that other contract services and the budget, a lot of it is trees. And to take out a tree is about three to $6,000, depending on the size of the tree. We're losing redwood trees and large pine trees left and right. And the city works with us in identifying those, that and Valley Vista. Um, we redid their blacktop working with the school side. They gave us a new plan, the mural we talked about, and then the battery backup microgrid system were under contract. Um, there was a change order on the consent tonight. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's struggling with things like procurement issues and escalating prices. We're super excited about this project and we're Petaluma Junior High. We're getting a brand new switch gear, which is a very big deal because that electrical um, switch gear is probably 70 plus years old. Um, every time I take a designer, an engineer, a PG &E or someone, they, they go out and look at it and they scratch their heads because it's so old. They don't, they, you don't see those very often. So that I'm anticipating summer. In fact, I've been working with Ed Services on summer school because we're going to have summer school there. So summer school ends July 15th. We turn off the power July 16th. And then they start installing the new switch gear, which is hopefully arriving the end of June. So cool. that sounds great. Casa Grande, you know, we replaced all the underground gas lines. Um, we did a new sidewalk next to Building M, which really improved their access. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the new asphalt in the trees. We were we added trees. Um, those are Chinese pistache trees, by the way, which are drought tolerant. They're beautiful yeah. trees. Um, the NMU OMU Plaza is well underway. Um, the the new shade structure is being we've had it. It's being delivered to the school site tomorrow, and they're gonna start installing it tomorrow. Most of the concrete work is done. And then landscaping, and then we're hoping that project's gonna be done very soon. So it's super exciting. Cool. That's when we might wanna have a ribbon cutting, cause it's just, it's gonna be beautiful. Yeah, Sheldon and I were there for office hours and 
It's just, we can see it's going to be great. It's transforming. It's going to transform that space for our student body. Absolutely. And I'm already working with food service on coming in because there's a whole area that you can serve lunches right there. Yeah. And it's going to be perfect. So we're actually talking about staffing for that so that we can get our students um, lunches in that area. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super exciting. I'm, I can't wait. Look at it. And we also worked with Sean and some of the music folks because it's designed to be more of a use for music so that they can go out and they can have concerts and in this beautiful outdoor plaza. So I, I'm just super excited about it. The fact that I graduated from CASA doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> and I'm glad to see that you're talking about painting as well. Yes, we are currently trying to get our color committee going, but yes, we definitely need some new colors. Um, and then also perhaps more importantly is we replaced the roof and the HVAC for the admin. And now we're actively working on that building M, which I know you guys have all heard about over this past year or so. Um, so basically new roof where the six units that are on that very large 24 classroom building building are going to get replaced. That'll become just the ventilation piece. And then each classroom will get their own individual heat. AC source Thank with God. a new thermostat <laughs> so they can control their own environment. What so a concept, crazy. controlling the temperature in your classroom. <laughs> you know, it's those little things I've yeah. learned. It's those little things. And then the battery back at microgrid, same thing. This July, we're planning on coming in um, and putting in. This doesn't have a new switch gear, so it's not quite as complicated as Petaluma Junior High, but we're hoping that that's going to be here this summer. Petaluma High School. Many of these are just kind of a restatement. The only thing I'll highlight here is we did put in 13 new trees. So we took out those sycamore, two large sycamore. By we, I mean the city in collaboration with the city. The city actually owned the trees. It was in the street, not on our property. But they did that successfully. We worked with the neighbors, identified new trees, did the new sidewalk. The city came in and repaired the street. So it was a true joint venture. And then we just had the 13 new trees planted, and it really looks fabulous. We I still planted have... one of those trees. You what? I planted one of those trees. Oh, oh at the front. So, <laughs> so that's, that's yeah, so we did English Street, but we did a whole uh, collaboration yeah. with students that's on Fair Street. So between the admin building and building A, and even wrapping around close to Carpe Diem, all new trees. I think like 14 trees got planted mm -hmm. there. And George Beeler, I want to give a shout out to George oh, Beeler gosh. because he's using his well because see, we're under a planting moratorium. Yeah. So we're using our well on the English street side, which is where the well is. And Mr. Beeler is using his oh. well to help water the trees that the students came and planted. Oh, that's so lovely. it was a real big joint. Marin that's Relief, great. I think was involved. <laughs> The city was very, um, it was a good partnership with them. They, they, we had to meet with them several times to get them to approve the exception to planting these trees and it, it worked out really well. So thank you for your help on that. Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny. It's like, yeah. Tree planting's fun. Yeah. I love, that. I love that it has a well. There's some benefits to being an old town. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. So then district-wide, I left a couple things here. I, I uh, On the next slide, I want to just give a shout. You know, we did that installation of the dark fiber back in, back in oh, 2020. Yeah. And I just want to give a shout out to Dave and his team because we worked hard on an E-Ray project. And that dark fiber, which then gets lit up, really improved our connectivity and that was all done without knowing that the pandemic was going to hit <laughs> and that that project really helped our students and our staff be able to stay connected at a much higher level than many of our neighboring districts so i just want to give a shout out we could not have known in 2019 and 20 of what a difference that that project would make so i just want to say it was completed in early 20 right as all of this stuff was hitting, as I recall. So I just want to give a shout out to Dave because he, he played a huge role in that. So the priest. Okay. The preschool building at McDowell. So that's the one on the corner of McDowell and Marie. It's not associated with McDowell Elementary. It was 
constructed by the County Office of Education back in 1969. It's been there forever. Um, so we are finally under some level of construction. There was demolition and abatement that started yesterday for the interior. We are out to bid for the interior renovations. Remember, this is mostly grant funded. We have our match that we're put in as well. Um, this is a super exciting project because it's really funded to be an all-inclusive or a, an inclusive special education, regular education, students of all abilities coming together in a fully integrated preschool program, which is fairly unique, which is why we got this million plus grant. And so we're working on getting the building done, getting some of the basic site work done. Our hope is to move the South County preschool program to this building, this hoping to have this building done in July for the year while we then reconstruct their new building. And then working with four C's to make sure that they can bring some of their students in too so we can start with this you know, um, inclusive preschool program. So we're super excited about that. Um, stay tuned, because um, I think that could be, um, we're hoping to do some really fabulous stuff out in the school site too, like sandboxes that are fully accessible that a student can pull up to in a wheelchair and have access to a sandbox. It's, it's those wonderful. types of things, yeah. So we're trying to be very thoughtful and not just throw in the standard stuff. And then transportation, installation of the 15 new charging stations were in design for that. Oh, that's so Again, this is a million dollar grant fund. I'll throw a shout out to Marsha Short who helped us get that grant. This is to support the 17 new electric buses. We're also working in collaboration with PG&E because they have to bring a new meter service because we get specific rates for charging that are different than the rest of the yard. And so we're working with the designer and PG&E to get a new switch gear, new meter, and then installation of the new charging stations, hopefully this summer. So that's, that's exciting. And I think that's it. That's really the bigger highlights. There's lots, lots more going on, but that just kind of gives you an example of some of the capital projects we're doing. Many of these are bond funded or a combination of bond grant or a combination of capital facilities or a combination of developer fees, like for the new, where we're expanding like at McKinley, we're using developer fees to help offset that cost. So anyway, any questions? It sounds great, Chris, thank you. Yeah, really. It's impressive. Was this all from like an original list or was it that you went to each site and you know worked with staff to kind of figure out what was needed at each site? That's a great question. It's it's just it's a combination of um, working with the principals and understanding what the challenges are. So, for example, working with Grant and finding out there's this weird rubberized surface that got put on the blacktop, and how do we address it? Or building M, you know, starting to really work and understand with our mechanical contractors, like what's really going on in the system, getting in and assessing challenges to find out are these short term solutions or do we need to come up? Do we need to have a designer come in? And then some of it is just looking around and really caring about our schools and saying, hey, Cherry Valley, you need paint. And if we're going to paint the school, let's think about changing the color. So a lot of it is just really um, getting in and knowing the facilities. And then as stuff comes up, um, you know, like yeah. the HVAC systems was brought to my attention very early on when I started here at Kenilworth. So yeah. I remember so, doing site visits and hearing all about it. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. and also looking at the measure for our bond and making sure what complies with the measure, what's an appropriate funding source. So it's a good marriage of knowing how do we fund the projects and then how do we implement the projects. And it's not all through that bond. Before, before I move on, I just want to, because Sheldon had asked a specific question. So if you'd bear with me for a moment, um, I wanted to touch on a couple things and this is gonna be hard to read so I can make you copies of this. Uh, yeah. Can you make it a little bit bigger? <clears throat> yeah. That's okay. Is so this is this is an analysis that I've done and I- here? No, okay. no. I, I've presented this to the bond oversight committee um, and this is just touching on if you, this is my analysis I show for the elementary measure it's so a 21 million authorization beginning balance. You can see in 1415 was zero. We sold $7 million worth of bonds that year. We collected some interest and then we had expenditures. Some of it related to election costs. 
some of it related to administrative costs, most of it related to capital improvements. And so each year, I then entered in all of the data, whether we sold bonds, you can see in 17, 18, we sold 8.9 million worth of bonds. And you can see the interest we've collected just since you probably can't read it. Um, like we, we got 31,000 year one, 27,000 year two, 26,000 year three, 33,000, 186,000 in 18, 19, because we sold the, that big bond. 167,000 the following year, et cetera. And then you can see final 2021 totals as Dave's getting close to that. And then the 21-22 projection for what, based on some of the projects we're doing, et cetera, right? So see if you go over a little bit more, see under that 21-22, that shaded 5145. Yeah. And then next to it, it says 20,999,903, mm -hmm. which is just under 21 million. <laughs> I really think we're going to have to contemplate another sale of bonds for both districts. And because down below, you might not be able to see the ending fund balance projected for this year would be $6 million if we sell the $5 million. So we're starting to get close. You know, when we get into summer of 22 and we're going to have bigger expenditures and beyond. So before I go into next steps, I want to just show you the high school district, and then we can talk a little bit about next yeah. steps. So the high school district, same format, only this is 68 million. 1415, we sold a bond of 23.5 million, roughly. It's never going to be an exact dollar amount generally because there's all sorts of premiums and other things that hit against it. Um, we, you know, we started collecting interest, 75,000 the first year, 55, 128 when we did 19 million. This was um, my second or third year here. And um, you can see 16, 17, we sold my first year, we sold 19.8 million because we needed the funds to do some of the big projects like paying for the track, track and field and paying for the pool and, and some other things. And then if you jump to the end, you can see that the 2021 final totals, and it just sums up what we've done today, both revenue and expense. And I'm suggesting we need to do a 12.6 million in bond sales again, because if you scroll down, Dave, a little bit, at the end of 21-22, really probably this summer, we're down to like 8 million if we sell 12 million. So we really need to start, and most of that work probably goes into the summer. I'm budgeting the whole project. We're not going to be paying all of that cash out by June 30th, but it just kind of gives you an idea that we're going to have to sell the bonds. So to do that, you know, there's a lot of steps. Matthew, as a superintendent, yet hasn't gone through a bond sale. I don't think that we sold any bonds since you guys have been on the board. Ellen, yes, but the, the other four, no. So what I'd like to suggest is that um, I know, Sheldon, one of the things you asked about is like, what was the original project list. planned? Right. Yeah. Project and the I, list. I, I, yeah, the project list was, it, it's, it's, it was um, extensive. it's vague. It's not as specific. It's specific in some ways and vague in others. And so what I'd like to do is, but it, as I was talking to Matthew about this presentation, it's not a 20 minute presentation. It's probably a two hour conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I'd like to suggest is maybe we find a study session yeah. that we can focus on some of this. I would have our financial advisor from Greg Isom, Greg Isom come, um, perhaps yeah. Bruce Kearns from Steve yeah, Foles exactly. come and kind of talk about the next steps. I can prepare or have them prepare like, there's a resolution you adopt and you do this and you right. do that, especially with interest rates going up too. I think it's going to be really prudent for us to get those bonds sold quickly. Um, I started going down this path, frankly, the end of December, early January, but then Omicron hit and our focus shifted to surviving the spike and making sure we had adequate PPE. But I think we need to refocus, or I would recommend we refocus back to this. We can then provide you with, you know, my attempt at like looking at the original estimates of what were originally contemplated, including the millions set aside for modernization, which most of the work that we're doing now is under. Mm -hmm. and so you can kind of have a, a look at it. And in order to sell bonds, we also have to come up with a plan to spend all of that bond money within three years. Mm -hmm. 
that becomes a more specific project list. And so we will have some work to do in order to do that. Um, I think we have a better idea now as we're looking at some of these bigger projects. Isn't um, when you make up the list of what you, isn't it usually very big? You're, you're not saying we're doing all of this, but these are things we could do. Yes, when you're looking at the Prop 39 project list, it is, it is big and all encompassing and somewhat vague. Modernization is an example. Right. We're going to modernize our buildings. Well, what does that mean? Exterior paint, interior paint, floor covering, lighting, mechanical units, roofs, all of that's included. When we're looking at the project list for the three year sale of bonds, that has to be more specific because we need to be able to show in a plan that at least we have a plan to use up all those funds. Right. We may not be able to, you know, like, we had a plan. We didn't spend all the money that we thought we were going to spend because when we did paint jobs, we were getting 50 cents on the dollar for the projects. That's a good thing. We're not going to complain. So, but we have to show that we have a plan, a, a realistic plan in place that we know generally how we're going to spend this money in three years. And so we would present a draft of that to you at the same time. So I think I saw on the elementary uh, summary you had, which was great, we're just $97 short, which is, you know, great. We're going we're gonna to blow it. We're going to spend all that money. On the secondary, it looked to me like we were 12 million left to go. Is that about right? Yes. Okay. So I didn't put in there because I don't know that we'll have a plan for the entire 12 million. Right. And this is what I put in the budget. Uh, and knowing we would have to spend probably sell at least 12 million, we might decide to spend all of it. So when we develop the project list, that will kind of inform how much that bond sale should be. The elementary was easy because we're kind of getting down to 5.6 million or less. But the secondary, we do still have about 25 million left to sell. Do we sell all of the 25 million? If we can show that the majority of that we can do in three years, then we might want to do that or maybe it's 20 million. I just plugged in what I thought minimally we should consider, but it may need to be bigger. But the other, the, I did have one specific question about that list, Chris, but I, I love the idea of a study session. Yeah. For this. Yeah. this is long-term planning and it deserves that kind of yes. attention. But um, in, in just discussions around the community, I've heard differing reports about how much art was supported on that on that list, specifically a performing arts center in Casa Grande. Yeah. Was that on that list? I'm, I've heard mixed, and I wasn't paying attention as a voter to look that closely back then. I was supposed to be on it. Well, uh, well it I, I can tell land. you, I, I can tell you, I did some analysis of that when I got here in 2016. And at the high school level, this is actually my working document from August 11th, 2016, I had been here about five weeks. Um, and I did this analysis and, you know, there was certificates of participation to be paid off, which is fine. Um, they had set aside at the time um, about, about, let's see. For the Casa Grande High School Performing Arts, it was about six six point five million dollars. So nine, for the Petaluma High School Performing Arts, it was about six point five million dollars. Maybe in site work. I mean, not even that. That's my thought. That's, You're looking at we, 40, we, 40 million dollars. Yeah. We yeah. went, we went out back in 2018 when I did this. We had actually gone out, worked with an architect, and looked at Gary and I went out, did a tour of several different performing arts center for schools around. And um, we were looking at the time about 35 million to do a, and so what the board at that time had talked about is there's really not space on Petaluma High School's campus to put a performing arts center. When you really think about the footprint and the clearances and everything else you have to have, it's just not doable. I've had architects look at it. Maybe if we went on the backside of the baseball field, you could potentially look at maybe a black box theater, but not a large performing center. CASA has the real estate to do it. We even identified where. Um, but when you're passing a $68 million bond to do all of these things, 
You almost need your own bond just to pass for the performing arts center. Right. Yeah. I, I, I firmly believe that CASA needs one. Yeah, I believe I because I believe the Petaluma community needs one. Yeah, we don't have one. Ask, can it be something that's a joint community effort with the city? Because the city thinks they're going to be using it too. And we want the community to use it. Well, we, we did have some conversations at the time with the city about prior to our current mayor and our current city manager um, about a joint use. And yeah, they're all in for using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just went with the, um, the, the poly class, the restoring poly class. Yeah. They, but that's they gave a, it to a nonprofit. Too. They, right. They're not going to. And I was just thinking about doing it in conjunction on a bond. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, right. You know, so that, you know, they're not putting out, the, they're they're helping the whole community with something. You know, we could certainly have some of those conversations. I, I, I you know, I, I firmly believe even Groner Park has the Spreckles Center. Right. I mean, we really have, very, we don't have a state of the art. So the idea at the time, this has been almost four years now. Yeah. I can't believe it's been that long <clears throat> that we were having these conversations with the board, Gary and I. And I remember and talking about having it not even labeled as Casa Grande, but more like the Petaluma Performing Art. We have the real estate at Casa. Mm -hmm. It would benefit the program at Casa. But having it be a, open yeah. to both high schools to use and our junior highs. And of course, other outside groups as well, but it's a big investment and in, in money, and it, it 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 probably needs its own unique bond. And the longer we put it off, the more expensive it's going to get. Absolutely, there's no doubt. But you know, it, it stuff happens. Priorities change, and we, you know, a lot of things happened in 1819 and then 1920. So it's it kind of we're constantly reprioritizing and we don't have the money to do it. So we were assuming at that time we were going to reallocate and we scraped together in 18, like 15 million out of the bond specifically for the performance hall. And then contemplating this 16.89 acres that's there as a way to help offset the variance or the cost, you know, that, that is possible still to consider selling that property. And what's but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, steps and you know with the with the push to actually do more housing in Petaluma right. it certainly is possible but there's a lot of steps to do that it's not like a a one year term and chris wasn't it um it got it it wasn't assessed as high as we had expected at a certain point you know, it's gone through several different gyrations. And so I think, you know, it actually was sold at one point. Yeah, it was, yeah. And then it didn't, it it, it fell through, the deal right. fell through. And so I don't recall all the details of that. That happened well before my time. So that's a whole different process. It would be separate from this process. That's something we can certainly talk about. It's a different set of consultants. Um, it's going to be harder to do than just passing a bond. So there's something to think about. You can you can use the sale, the proceeds from the sale of property for any type of bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. It's not to be used for operational expenses. Yeah, we would have to use the money. To it's an back. asset of the students of Petaluma, and so it has to go back into another asset. But it could be any asset at the time. So, yeah. yes, Sheldon, just to give you an idea, I mean, literally the amount of money set aside that I could glean for um, Cherry Valley's track and field was 150,000. We spent 500,000. So some of the dollars seem to be somewhat unrealistic that were in the original list that I could find. And also with the original list, once the bonds passed, the prices have already gone up. The cost of doing business has already gone up by the time you pass the bond. Sure, but even in 2014, you weren't gonna build a performance hall for six and a half million. Oh, no, no. So could that be part, if we have the study session, could that be yep. part of the discussion? Is is all of that around building mm -hmm. and, you know, the Performing Arts Center and, yes, you know, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's really identifying where, you know, we have the bond, we need to, we need to continue using our bond authorization, um, which we still have about 24, 25 million in the secondary, about five and a half million in the elementary have the plan for how we're going to do that. That's kind of the first piece. And then it's really the longer term, long range planning for does the district believe that a performance hall is 
a priority for the district and how do we want to accomplish that if it is? I think we should move on only because this wasn't all on the agenda. You know, like I feel like we're strained a little bit. If we are going to have, you know, yeah, I just requested well, that it be um, on there. If we yeah. do the city, yeah, we can do that. Sure. Business. So Matthew and we can work together on identifying a time to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we had. Well, you want to want to continue with this, or you want to keep moving? Yeah, on? I feel like we should. About it in future business, yeah, yeah. business. just because, yep. yeah. yeah, yes, yeah, people haven't had a chance to, yes, yeah, we didn't say that we're gonna be talking about all of these things, but thank yep. you, Chris. Uh, okay, comments from the public on non agenda items. Do you guys need a break? Are you good? No, we're good. Okay. Let's okay. Keep going. All right. So, we are going to open the chat for a few minutes. Um, if you want to comment on something that's not on the agenda. Put your first and last name in the chat and what you would like to speak about. And while it's open, I'm going to read our uh, public comment. Your policy. Water. Under government code section 54954.3a, members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest, providing it relates to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. While government code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, program services, and or employees, the district does have a policy specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. If the comment is about something that is not on the agenda, it will be heard only during the public comment on non-agendized items period. Once that part of the meeting is over, comments will only be taken on agenda items during, during the discussion of those items. The board values public comments, and although we cannot take action or discuss items not on the agenda, we listen carefully and appreciate input from the public. Public comments are subject to a four minute per person limit or 20 minute limit per subject matter. So we'll leave it open for a little bit longer in case someone else has a comment. Oh. Wait. Yeah. You want to know All right, I think we can close the chat. Looks like we have one uh, public comment from Renee Ho about HI curriculum. Welcome, Renee. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Hi, everyone. It's always a pleasure and genuine honor to be here and be able to speak with you all. My name is Renee Ho from Amor Para Todos. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. And I hope everyone's having a great night. And I just wanted to start by thanking Esmeralda and Shireen, and I'm sorry, Patty, maybe I didn't catch the name, and the entire HI committee for spending their time and putting their energy um, and intention into finding a curriculum for the PCS students. I had the pleasure for the first time to meet you, Esmeralda, um, in collaborating and sharing resources. And I just want to say it was a genuine pleasure um, to get to collaborate and work with you. And I think it's just we're all grateful to have you at PCS. Um, I am wanting to share, and this is the uh, challenging part sometimes um, advocating is when you just really uh, jive and really believe in, in all of these people and what they're doing um, and their intention, because I believe it's a million percent pure from everyone on the committee. Um, and in my work with the more Pada Todos, I have the pleasure to vet out um, and read in great detail the curriculums that the committee went through, Superstar Health Education, Health Connected, and Planned Parenthood. And I shared, I also admire and respect the director of um, play, uh, the HI, the, I'm sorry, Health Connected Curriculum, Parent. Um, we spoke and worked together as well. And what I do want to say, um, which I shared with Perrin and Esmeralda, is that um, CHIA, which is referred to the California Health Youth Act, 
one of the main things is that the curriculum has to be appropriate for all genders. And I did share with them with the utmost respect, um, humbly, that Health Connected still has some room to grow, as we all do, and being more inclusive. Um, it is not the most inclusive curriculum that I saw, and I say that respectfully, and I share that respectfully with all the folks um, who I spoke with about it, as they do still use as their main terminology, binary terminology, male and female. So for the gender fluid, transgender student population, um, there's there's um, visuals, there's games that are directed in the binary where it does leave and can make um, trans and non-binary students feel invisible and left out. Um, again, respectfully, I would not feel comfortable having um, a trans or non-binary kiddo do some of the activities. Um, the genderbred visual focuses on the um, the sex symbol being a biological private part, which equates that with um, one's gender, which isn't the case. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I think there's room for improvement here. And what I'm asking is that during this pilot process, if maybe the teachers can adapt some of that, um, that language, because I do um, just want to thank you all again for you know, the intention of making it inclusive, because I know what is there and I feel that, but I just think there is some room to grow with this. And at the end of the day, you know, the students are the most important. That's why I'm here speaking, not to say this is not this or this, like I just always, it comes back to the students and what's best for their mental health and visibility and representation and to be completely in compliance with Chaya for the best interest of the students, it really does need to have um, inclusive language that makes them feel seen versus, um, you know, having to fit into that binary mold. Again, with the utmost respect, thank you, Esmeralda. Thank you, HI committee. Thank you for hearing me out and knowing it comes with a place from love. And um, if anyone would like any um, support, if I can provide it to help make it even more inclusive during this pilot process, I would be honored to and always honored to be here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was that the only comment? Yes. Okay. Uh, next up, report on activities and correspondence. Um, since the last board meeting, office hours at Petaluma High, Carpe Diem in San Antonio, CSBA legislative meeting with Senators Levine, Senator McGuire, legislate, legislative assistance, State Senator Bill Dodd, NAACP Ed Committee meeting, K-12 curriculum meeting, um, Malaya, our student board member, had her IOU meeting and attended BSU and student council advisory meeting. Anyone have anything to add or want to speak about anything? Sure, I just want to take a minute to talk about our legislative uh, advocacy because it's directly related to a lot of the uh, comments we've been hearing from the public over the last couple of board meetings regarding potential um, layoffs of staff um, and due to a projected budget cut that's based upon enrollments. So and just for the viewing audience out there, it's several of us on the board have been advocating this past week with our state legislators. And I guess the message that I want to put out there is uh, I, I, we want to recruit our parents and teachers to help us with this advocacy to contact our senators, our assembly people uh, that represent us. Um, they are projecting a record surplus uh, budget for the state of California, but we're not gonna see it at Petaluma City Schools if their funding formulas remain the same and or, or remain the way that the governor proposed back in January. Our, it's undeniable that our enrollments have gone down. And on top of that, the pandemic has called our has forced our ADA, our average daily attendance, to go down, and those are the two things that the state uses to figure out how much money PCS gets. And so, what our message, what the board's message was to our state legislators, were we need relief from ADA funding because we did our part to battle Omicron by keeping our kids at home. Our families did their parts by keeping their families at home to make the public safer. And we're going to get punished for it because the budget is funded that way through ADA. So, parents, teachers, staff, help us out here. Call up our representatives in Sacramento, tell them to give us relief from ADA funding 
uh, through the pandemic and also to raise the floor of the LCFF funding. This is with a surplus budget in this state. This is a beautiful moment to really uh, fund education the way that we value it. And we need to tell our state legislators uh, to do that. And to piggyback on that, it used to be that if it's an absence was excused, we made, we got money and now they took that away. So, and that goes back to COVID where these kids are absent, they should, they're excused and yet we're paying a penalty because excused absences no longer count. So for the bulk of Petalumans, um, your assembly member is Mark Levine and your state Senator is Bill Dodd. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you oh, both. Uh, oh, good. Governor Newsom. <laughs> yeah, 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 knock down his. <laughs> the California Department of Finance, the California Department of Education, to actually advocate for um, for these, particularly these two issues, which directly impact our ability to um, do everything here. So. Tony Thurman, we can just keep Tony calling Thurman. out names. Tony Thurman. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next item, comments from the public on consent agenda items. If there's anyone in the public that wants to comment on anything on the consent agenda, please put your first and last name in the chat and which item you would like to speak towards. I think we can close the chat. Not seeing any. There, there are no public comments for um, consent items. Caitlin, did you say so? Okay. All right. Um, consent. Approval. I move to approve the agenda. Okay. agenda. Thank you. That's a second. Deal. All right. Any questions or comments? I had a bunch about the. Um, the bond performance, uh, but <laughs> Chris, Chris read my mind and shared the answer all those questions. <laughs> awesome. Thank okay. you for doing all yeah, that. Yeah, that was that's great, Chris. That was a lot. Thank you. This will be some good reading material. And we'll be presenting it to the Bond Oversight Committee at our next meeting. Okay. Well, that's great to have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Katie, do you have any questions or comments on anything? Um, on the consent right agenda. Now. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, wait. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Katie. I know we're supposed to Aye. get your um, your preference. In yeah, it. your right. preference. Okay. All right. Comments from the public on action items. We will reopen the chat. Same thing. First and last name and what you would like to speak towards. Um, regarding one of the action items. Okay, I think we can close the chat. There are no no um, comments from the public on action items. All right. So first up, we acknowledged just earlier AB three sixty one. Um, every thirty days, we have to take a look at health conditions. Our options are either to um, be remote only, uh, hybrid, which is what we're currently doing, or in person. So. Um, I'll start with Katie so I don't forget this time. Do you have a preference on one of these before we vote? 
Um, we're talking about meeting in person? Yeah, about our, how we conduct our meetings yeah. in person, hybrid, or we're doing remote. hybrid right now. So I love hybrid. Love. Okay. I mean, right. obviously, working towards in person would be awesome, yeah. but yeah, yeah. we already are doing that. So oh, it's great. Yeah. People who feel comfortable can still come. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? You, you guys still fine with hybrid number two? Yeah. I think hybrid is great as long as possible because it's yeah. more accessible, the more. Yeah, I agree. That's what I think. I hope they continue it. Me too. Yeah. I agree. Also considering what's happening in Europe and right. Yeah. 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 Too, just the pandemic is over. Right? It just, yeah. It's still here. We need to. I move to, to stay in hybrid, the hybrid model for the next 30 days. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, um, Jason, do you want to present the next item? Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, this is our, uh, we're putting forward our tentative agreement with, uh, between Petaluma City Schools and the Petaluma Federation of Teachers. You can see that not only do we have the tentative agreement, but it was ratified with a overwhelming majority vote from the from PFT. We've also attached the revised salary schedules for 2020-21 and 2021-2022 uh, with this item as well. So Katie, this is just us approving the teacher contracts. They've been in negotiations for a while. So do you have a preference before we vote? Um, I don't know enough about it. Okay. You just want to abstain? Yeah, good, okay. honest answer. Thank you. All right. So I move to approve um, the tentative agreement to the collective bargaining between Petaluma City Schools and PFT. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. I'd just like to thank our, our negotiations team yeah. yes. Um, yes. From, from, the, from the district office as well as as well as Petaluma Federation of Teachers. Yes. I think it's a collaborative process we've seen. Um, and the fact that it, it passed so overwhelmingly with an overwhelming majority, um, just it, it's wonderful, wonderful yeah. that we can provide compensation increase, you know, significant compensation increases to our, our um, certificated staff. And I just appreciate all the work from, from both negotiations teams. Thank you. Yeah. We do Thank too. You. Thank yeah. You. Considering the past two years, it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you. And doubly so, it, given the environment that we see not yeah. far around mm -hmm. us where it's not as successful. So yeah. thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, you found really creative ways to do this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Labor of love. Thank you. All right, next up, Jason, this is you. I just want to explain the holiday. Yeah, so Change. Uh, this resolution is one that allows us to designate um, September 9th, which is a, known as admission day and move that to be observed on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, November 23rd. And we do this regularly and uh, I'm bringing this forward for the calendar for next year. Cool. Great. I move to approve resolution 2122-24. 23. Oh, 23, sorry. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Katie, could we comment uh, about this? Aye. Okay. All right. Um, next up, election sequencing. So, um, <laughs> <ooh. laughs> <laughs> explain that. <laughs> Matthew, do you want to talk sure. about that? So, the last the last meeting, you approved the the final election sequencing for trustee uh, area elections. I was, I attended the, we, I brought that to the county, <clears throat> county office of education um, board meeting on, on election um, sequencing. And at that meeting, our attorney brought up, there was a, a technical or a, um, a clerical error on the map, <clears throat> just that we needed to, we need to be more clear which trustee areas were actually up for reelection next year. Um, and so we know that I don't I'm not going to say the numbers because I'm not sure I don't have the map in front of me, but we know that um, Maddie Cloud and we know that Joanna Pond and we know that Caitlin Quinn, the, the areas that are there that they are in are the areas that are up for re-election for 2022. Sheldon and, and Joanna's areas would be up for a re-election in 2024. Oh, sorry. 
Sheldon and Ellen's area will be up for, in, for re-election in 2024. So we wanted to make sure that it was really clear on the map. The county actually said, you know, this is a, this is a, a clerical error. All we need you to do is bring, the, bring this back to have your board um, approve this resolution. Mm -hmm. And then once that is complete, bring it, we'll bring it back to the county. We don't, they don't even need to vote again. They're, they've already approved it with the understanding that we're going to make this technical edit tonight. I move to pass resolution 2122-24. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Katie? Aye. Aye. All right. Moving on to discussion and information items. Um, Jason, is this you? It's Matthew. For the policy updates oh, and gamut. I can, I can give you an update on this. So these are... Um, so CSBA came up with their, their model and, and it's, it's on the, the gamut system. So when we look up, um, when you look up titles on various different topics, there's a, quite a few of them you'll, you'll see here. These are um, the, the new naming norms or the, the new way that they're, they're, they're putting titles on each of the, um, so when we look up an, in gamut for a specific board policy, we want it to match the the model policy in CSB and that's on that's listed on gamut. All this is doing is bringing us into um, into alignment with CSBA. Oh, okay. the title. So minor changes to the to the the um, the title of board policies. So that's all it is. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So moving on now, future business Not policy is that. Just same okay. for policy deletions. Oh, items yeah, are those and then tied together? in policy deletions, you can take a look at these. Are um, I, I have to pull yeah, it myself? They're obsolete. They're obsolete, obsolete policies that are you know typically may have been a funding source from a long time ago. That's or something that's that has now changed. High and so they're high school graduation, et cetera, exam. KC, different exams that we don't offer, we don't provide anymore. So it's just bringing us up to date. That's all it is. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Future business uh, study session for the bond. Talking about the bonds. Anything else for future business? So under future business for the bonds, we, we had... Um, Chris, I had spoken about the potential of doing that as that's um, board study session on Tuesday, May 3rd. It's a Tuesday from five to seven. It's a non board meeting evening. Um, just want to make sure that that works for everybody before we set up uh, what, May 3rd as a study did, session, Tuesday, you, May 3rd. And it's just, is it going to be six o'clock? Five, five to seven. Five to seven. So we'll do five to seven. Okay. Does that work for everybody brain. here? <laughs> yeah, that works. Unless okay. I'm in St. Louis. <laughs> so you, and if you are, you can always zoom in. <laughs> but we want to, we want to give the, we want to give the update before we get um, too knee deep in, in the budget development process. Yeah. So that's sort of one of the last Tuesdays we could do before. Yeah, that's so. great. Works okay. for me. All right, great. We'll set it up. Karen, we'll set it up. Thank you, Karen. Um, anyone else? Anything for future business? I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just really, really quickly. Um, so at a couple of board meetings, uh, I'm sorry, office hours, um, <clears throat> we heard about A through G uh, requirements in alternative ed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just some concerns around it, how it would work. Um, and so, and also kind of linking it to the Aranda study um, about, uh, you know, upping our A through G, having a college going culture, building that culture. And it had me thinking about a couple of things. One is what is our college to career program, including our, our counseling staff, our teaching staff, our classified staff and our college and career centers. You know, we haven't had a presentation from them for a long time. I know they do a tremendous amount of work and it's really good. I also really want to hear particularly about 10,000 degrees mm -hmm. and kind of why they're not at 
the alternative ed sites. I know it's not in their contract, but it seems like that's really where the work is, especially given the Arenda study. So, um, if so, we could do something around that, sure. No, I'll be, I mean, and, and this is you know definitely linked to board goal <laughs> around yeah. and, and objectives around um, A through G and A through G plan. We actually talked about this today in in cabinet about some additional funding A through G and what, how, what that was going to look like. So I think we were already anticipating bringing some sort of presentation to the board. I don't know, Tony, feel free to, to jump in with, I don't know what, what kind of time frame we were looking at, but we, we, we were, we've been discussing and we discussed it again today, and so. Our alternative school um, campuses don't, are not A through G, is that true? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Most of those class courses that they take, uh, I don't believe are A through G. I think maybe there might be a, one or two courses that are, uh, but uh, it's not something that's, systematic in, in the old ed schools. But um, the, uh, we are receiving an A3G grant and um, and I'll be presenting that um, at the next board meeting in April. Uh, and then I'll address the other issues as well. Can you address 10,000 degrees also? Yep. I, yeah, we just had a meeting with them last week. So I, I will yeah, share really the data like with about that as well. Where yeah. all that money's going. Yeah, we were really yeah, surprised I, that they weren't at. Well, they were, the they didn't even, it. yeah, we were like. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, I was shocked that they weren't at San Antonio, like at all. I was. It's not in their contract. And we were just, yeah. I, I think you and I were having a discussion about are, when, are we getting enough bang for our buck with 10 KD? Yep. We met with them and we we all have data data ready for you still so today. Next board meeting, we'll bring an update. Cool. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Um, action items heard in closed session on item 4.3. It was. Um, moved by Caitlin Quinn and seconded by Sheldon Jen, and it was approved five to zero vote. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>